Protectors of the Suna. Suna Protectors of the Suna. Ina alaham duty law, wasala, wasalam Allah, wa rasulallah. Welcome to another uh, session of our series on the resurrection. And we're speaking about the minor resurrection. The minor resurrection addresses what happens at death. What happens to the human being when we die? And we've been covering this topic from A to Z. Everyone has uh, is curious about death. You know, as human beings, we're always, you know, curious about the unknown. You know, well, Allah told us what we need to know about death, how we talked about how the soul is pulled based on how you lived your life. We talked about what happens in the grave. It's not just the questioning of the grave. Well, but what happens after that when you see that either a handsome man or you see either an ugly man? And then what happens after that? What happens after seeing the ugly or handsome man? Can anyone remind us? After you are shown uh, in your grave and you see an ugly man or a, uh, you experience either an ugly man or a, a handsome man, what happens after that? Can anyone tell us? You are either rewarded or punished. What does that mean? Rewarded how or punished how? You're going to go to hell or you're going to go to paradise. Okay, what goes there? Can anybody give us more details? What does if she mean? The, if, the other, if, the, if the handsome man... You see the handsome man, that means you get your good deeds in your right hand. Okay. You don't go to paradise. No, not that, it's not quite so. Anyone can want to help her out? Anyone else? What happens um, when you, after you see that handsome or that, or that pretty man? Go ahead, Abiba. The handsome man represent your good deed and um, the ugly man represent your bad deed. So you're, um, if, the the handsome men that represent your good deeds, your soul will be put in, um, will be in the form of a grim bird, whereas the ugly men that represent your bad deeds, your soul will be put in hell. Exactly. That's what you need to say, Amina. What happens? You don't go nowhere. Your soul, if you see the handsome man, your soul is either placed in a paradise but if you see the ugly man, your soul is placed in, in the hellfire. Why is it that I couldn't take Amina's answer? Can anyone tell me why? She said, you go either hell or paradise. Why come I couldn't take her answer? No one answers their body and soul. Right, exactly, because she said, you go. What do you mean by you? Are you saying that our, we, our whole body goes into paradise? No, no one will enter paradise or hell in body and soul until the day of judgment. So we have to be more explicit. We have to learn how to break things down and express ourselves. You don't just say you go. You go is what the Christians believe. The Christians believe that if we die, you go straight to heaven. They mean body and soul. That's not the case. And then there's other Muslims who have deviant belief systems that don't mean that either. So I want y'all to remember, you have to be, when we speak about death and when we speak about paradise and hell, you have to be more explicit because the prophet Muhammad was very explicit with us because he do, doesn't want us to uh, uh, be confused with the, what the Christians and the unbelievers believe about what happens in these situations. So... We talked about that. We talked about how after you see that handsome or that beautiful man, that's when your soul is separated from the body. Your soul is separated from the body. And the soul will either uh, be placed in the hellfire to be punished 
for whatever sins you died upon, or the soul will be placed in a, a form in paradise. And what happens to the body? I mean, the prayers, now what happens to the body when the soul is, is, it leaves it at this point? If the person was a good person and he went and he's in a green bird, his soul is being crushed one time and it's going to open up and it's going to smell the beautiful mm -hmm. fra fragrance. If it was a other soul, it's just going to be getting crushed and crushed. Yes, that's why I want to make sure you understand. That's why you got, you got, because that's another thing. Our, remember, our soul separates. I want y'all to remember, your soul separates. The body remains in the grave. Okay, because we have some deviant groups out there who call themselves Muslims who don't believe in this, which is sad because it means that their Akita is not correct. And if they don't straighten it out, they're going to be in a, in, a, in a bad, have a bad ending. But they have went and actually still to this day, we have these people that dig up graves. They dig up graves trying to prove that people ain't being punished. That's how ignorant these people are. That's because the soul is separate from the body, idiot. Okay? The soul is of the unseen world in this world. So you're not going to see what the soul is doing. So this is what we spoke about the last time. And I want to give you guys a quiz because we talked about how there are different types of souls. There are different types of souls. That was our last um, discussion. So let's look at the quiz here. What are the three types of souls? We discussed how there are three types of soul. Sister Fatima, go ahead. Yes, there are three different souls. There, there is a soul that is controlled by its whims, meaning its desi sudden desires, and they commit the sin. And that means they're disobedient. Then there's a soul that's inclined to evil, which does evil things and repents. No, they don't repent. They just do, e it's inclined to evil. Then there's a self reapproaching soul that which is sins and repents. And that's called a self reapproaching soul. Okay, does anybody disagree As with her answer? Okay, I see other hands up. Let's call on Tarek. Go ahead, Tarek and Yasmin. What are the three types of souls? Um, the first soul is the one that gives into their desire, their desires and the evil around them. And the second soul is the one that holds itself accountable. And the third soul is the one that is in content with that which Allah wills. Okay, what do you guys think of her answer? Whose answer do you guys think is correct? Yasmin or Fatima? Fresno, who do you think was correct? Yasmin. Okay, Habiba? Yasmin. Exactly. That, that's the correct. You got three types of souls. One soul that sometimes does good and sometimes does evil. Okay? This is the soul that holds itself accountable. You know, you're conscious. Okay, I made a sin. So I'm going to go ahead and repent. And then the other type of soul that doesn't, it could care less. It just gives in its desires. It does whatever it wants. It has no conscience. It could care less about holding itself accountable. And then the third type of soul is a soul that is in sync with the law. It obeys a law. It's in a, a state of obedience to a law. Okay. So the question is, what type of soul do you have? That was your homework. I hope y'all figured out what type of soul you have. Okay. And that brings us to the next question. Question number two. Good job, uh, Yasmin. Of those three souls, which is the soul we Muslims should work hard to try to uh, have? And why is it that that's the soul we should work hard to uh, uh, possess? Go ahead, Mina. We want to have the soul that was trained to do nothing but what Allah commanded to do. And when we, the complete um, 
the complete rest in place. Why? Exactly. Oh, why? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm going to, I'm testing. Tell them. Oh. Why. <laughs> uh, why? Because we want um, our soul to be uh, ease. When Allah take our soul, we want our to be in the um, um, green to have to to be in the green bird. We want exactly. Allah to have soul. Exactly, guys. That's the so we all should be working hard to try to train yourself to be constantly you know, in, in, in that resting position where you're not going up and down, up and down, sometimes committing sins and sometimes not. You want to make that soul be, at, be in, in content with Allah's laws, Allah's commands. This is the soul of a person that is not deliberately, intentionally doing anything wrong. You know, I'm not deliberately intentionally, not that I know of. I don't know of any, I mean, nobody is perfect. But the difference with this type of person is this person's not can honestly say, I am not deliberately, intentionally committing no sin. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. We all make mistakes. And I'm probably making mistakes because I'm not perfect. But am I deliberately disobeying a law? Am I intentionally disobeying a law? No, I'm not. That's the kind of soul we all need to be working on. How many of you have that? Some of us can say we have that type of soul. Most of us do not. And we talked about there how there are some things we can do to help get to having that type of soul. Who can remember what are some of the things that we say that we can do uh, for as a woman, for example? What are some things you can do as a woman to try to reach that level of a soul? Go ahead, Malion. I would say as a woman, you should be staying at home. Um, surround yourself, like, say, for example, on this website with, like, strong believing Muslims. Um Honestly, like being in a state of remembrance, like reflecting on your actions, holding yourself accountable. You know, you're not perfect, but knowing that there are certain things or certain weaknesses that you have working on. And when you're alone, you can focus on a lot better. Exactly. And that's why Allah says stay home. It's not because Allah thinks you a woman and you a dog. It's not because, you know, anybody's being oppressive, but your home is better for you because you're less likely to fall into sin. You're less likely to deliberately, intentionally disobey a law. So that's why we talked about it as a woman, one of the best ways to get that type of soul is to stay in your house, to only go out when you have to. And when are examples of when I have to, if I have to go to work, if I have to go to the store, if I have to go to school, but other than that, I'm staying in my house. I don't have to go to a henna party. What happens at henna parties? Can anybody tell me? If you go to a henna party, what are the chances of, what are some of the things that you are have uh, stand a chance of 95% doing? Go ahead, Lucy. Backbiting. Backbiting Gossip. is one. Gossiping. Gossip gossiping, spreading rumors. These are the sins of the tongue that destroy people. Showing off, bragging and boasting about your man. What do women like to do? We're jealous of other women and we want to pretend or make ourselves think that we're superior over other women. So if I go to a henna party, I'm going to be sitting there. Oh, let me tell you what my husband did for me. Let me tell you what my husband bought me. Especially if you marry and the other women amongst you are single. What do married women do when they're around women that's single? It's just part of female nature. The prophet talked about this in a beautiful hadith. The married women like to boast and brag and throw up to the single women how they getting it. And they ain't. That's just the way of the world. You know, we, we just do that. So, you know, it's best to just stay home, stay to yourself, because you're going to when you get around a bunch of other women, you're going to do that. You're going to boast and brag and try to make yourself stand out over them. You're going to use that tongue in a wicked way. 
you're going to take off that hijab and try to show off your hair. Why do y'all think at these henna parties, women strip their clothes? The prophet's wives didn't do that. The prophet's wives never unveiled themselves around other women. But women today, when you go to these wedding parties, these henna parties, what do Muslim women do? They think that now I can let everybody see how long my hair is, how pretty my hair is, how straight my hair is, how this, and I can take off my jilbab and show them how big my butt is, how big my breast is to the other women. Women do that. Women that lack in fear of Allah. And the temptation to do it is great when you go around a bunch of other women, especially when you by yourself. So that's why, you know, that Allah says your home is better. Stay home. You protecting yourself and saving other people from your evil. And y'all know I'm speaking the truth. You know, remember that beautiful hadith where the prophet said that it was told, brought to his attention. Because a woman came and told him, she said, we like to go out and gather at the place where we wash clothes. They didn't have washing machines back in those days. So what the women would do was take their dirty clothes and they would go to a part of a river or a stream that this part was just used not for bathing in, but for washing the clothes. And they would beat the clothes on a rock and talk and gossip. And this is when the, the women who were married would boast and brag. Let me tell you what my husband did. My husband did this for me. And then another woman would say, oh, well, my husband did that for me. And this other woman was, was really, now there was a couple of single women there. They sitting there washing their clothes, knowing that these women were trying to make them feel inferior because they were single. So this one woman, oh, she spoke a whole lot. She took it to a, not only a what he do for her financially, but she took it to the bedroom. Oh, yeah. She took her, what her husband do to her to the bedroom. Didn't know that it was having the opposite effect. She thought it would make the other women jealous. She thought it would make the other women feel inferior. No, that one girl, woman who didn't look like her because she said, and my husband like a woman with a big butt. And I got that. My husband like a woman with big breasts. I got that. This little skinny woman was sitting there listening. But all she did was make her desire her husband. So you know what the skinny woman did? The skinny woman went home. She found her husband and married him. Married him. And so another woman went to the prophet and told him, he said, she said, do you know what they do when the women go to wash clothes? They sit there and boast and brag about their husbands. And she told him this one sister was really doing it. And so she got mad because she, she was boasting about how her husband likes a certain type of woman. Didn't know that she made a, this one of the single sisters go out and the, she, she ended up marrying her husband. And she was shocked. And the prophet laughed. He said, first of all, he said, he, he gave a kutba about it. And he said, I heard, he said, it was brought to my attention that you women like to do this. He said, but guess what? I heard the men do it too. He said, don't you women know that a man likes variety? He said to that sister, so you're surprised that your husband married your sister in faith. When she looks nothing like you, she's the opposite of you. He said, don't you know that a man loves variety? Yeah, he liked you because of your big hips, but he also wanted a skinny one too. And that's what happens when you boast and brag about what your husband do for you. Because he'll be doing it with somebody else. Lesson learned. So that's what happens at these henna parties. That's what happens at these marriage parties and baby showers and stuff. Women do this. They've been doing it since Allah made Eve. And the prophet also said men do it too. Men do the same thing too. 
So this is why Allah sent down that verse of the Quran saying that your house is better for you. Just if you stay home, especially for us women, because we suffer with that desire to boast and brag and, and, and gossip more than men do. Stay in your house and protect your tongue and protect your private parts that way and work on bettering yourself. So this is one of the best ways for a woman to train her soul to be in content and, 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 and in sync with Allah's commands, stay home. Keep yourself out of trouble. That's why a woman gets more blessings practicing her religion in her house. The masjid is a place for men, not women. Even though a man cannot stop a woman from going to the mosque, every time you sisters pray in the mosque, you are losing half the reward. You're getting only half the reward of praying in your house. It's best to stay your butt at home, make your prayers in your house, log going to Sunnah followers, learn your deen. You sisters are getting more blessings sitting in this Zoom room with me learning from me, listening to the drama here, then going to a mosque. Y'all getting more blessings because you in your house and you protecting yourself from people out there who are vicious, who could really hurt you. We can't hurt you here. Okay. And what can men do? What are some suggestions that a man can do you know, to train his heart to be that way. Anyone got any? What do we talk about? Go to the mosque. Yes, exactly. For you brothers, one of the ways to train your soul is by spending most of your time at the mosque. That don't mean neglect your family. I mean, you go to work, you come home and give your wife her time, give your children their time, but you need to be at the mosque making your prayers. You should be at the mosque, or, 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 you know, doing some itikaf on some of the weekends and stuff like that. A man whose heart is tied to the mosque is a man who will be under the throne of Allah on the day of judgment. So for you brothers, the mosque is better for you. I look at a person like Bimru, brother Bimru. He stays at the mosque. If he ain't at home with his wife, where is Bimru? He's at the mosque. That's a man whose heart is attached to the mosque. It's better for him. And you sisters, it's better for you to stay home. The home is your reward, not the mosque. And that's one of the signs of the last hour. One of the signs of the last hour, the prophet said, is the mosques will become filled with women instead of men. And we see that now. More women in the mosques than men. Ain't that something? What irony is that? So that's the type of soul we should aspire to have. Also, next question, is it possible for a person to have the attributes of all three souls? Yes or no? What do you guys think? Is it possible for a person to have the attributes of all three souls? Yes or no? Jayla, is that my um, door dash? Is it possible? Actually, no. Who's that on the mic? I can't hear. Oh, Mina, I just said no. Okay, why not? Oh, you said she said it's not. Do you ever, first of all, everybody agree with her? The question is, is it possible to possess attributes of all three? Yes or no? She said no. Everybody in agreement? No. Okay, what you say, Amina? I said yes. Okay, the correct answer is yes, it is possible. It's oh, possible it that we can possess attributes of all three. Sometimes a person repents, then sometimes they go through that period of weakness of faith where they just give in to their desires and don't repent for nothing. You know, so it is possible that you can have attributes of all three or even two of these souls. OK. And let's look at the next question. This is a big one. Does the soul die? Yes or no? When we no. die, does the soul die? Yes or no? No. no. 
Okay. Everybody saying no. No. Okay. Why not, Sabrine? Because the soul leaves the body and it goes to where it's either inside of a green bird or it sometimes they go to hell. Excuse okay. Me. Okay. Good job. Anyone else? Why? Uh, uh, what happens to the soul? Anybody? She did a good job. What happens to the soul? Anyone else? Want to add to it or, or anything? Exactly. The soul doesn't die. It separates from the body. Everybody understand that? And that's the response you'd give if uh, your children ask you, mom, does the soul die? You know, no, it separates from the body. When you die, when the body dies, the soul is separated and taken up. We talked about how it's taken up to the heavens, written in the book of either Eileen or the book of, of uh, the other book. And then it's put back in the body when the person's in the grave. And then after it experiences what happens in the grave, it still doesn't die. It goes to either, like she said, the bird form or the hellfire. So technically, no, the soul does not die. The spirit lives on. You know, it carries on. Okay, but uh, the body dies, but the soul is not. It's separated. Good job. And... We talked about the different types of souls and what happens to them when they separate. Where will the soul of the martyr be compared to the soul of the believers when they are in El Berzak? Go ahead, Melion. Um, the soul of the true martyrs that did not die upon any debt are like not questioned in the grave and their soul is transformed into a green bird. They'll be allowed to fly around um, different garters in paradise. On the other hand, the righteous believers um, will be questioned in the grave and a handsome man will appear to them and inform them that their soul will be transformed into a green bird and they'll be taken up you know, to the heavens and they'll go to paradise hanging on the fruit trees of paradise. And then the soul of the believers will also, you know, experience being, you know, praised while their soul is like going up and they'll have like interactions with other souls. And those souls will like ask them, how is the condition of so-and-so? Like, how is this person doing? Um, the Prophet some said that the souls of the Muslim is in the form of green bird um, hanging in the trees of paradise until Allah returns its body on the day of resurrection. Exactly. And that she gave the whole detailed answer. But the difference, if y'all picked up, is the martyr soul flies freely around the crops of paradise. Whereas the believer soul, does it fly freely? No. Where is it at? It, it, it hangs on the free trees and paradise. Exactly. It's hanging on the tree, talking to the other souls, but it doesn't fly around paradise. Y'all see the difference? So that's the difference between a martyr and a regular believer who died in good standing. The martyr is allowed to fly around paradise freely. Whereas for those of us who die in good standing, we're in the form of a bird hanging from the fruit trees, talking to each other, but we don't get to wander around paradise. That's the difference. Everybody understand that? Remember that to teach it to your children. If you, they die a martyr, they're flying around in paradise with wings. But if they're, they are in good standing, they'll be hanging from the trees, able to communicate and stuff, but not fly around freely. That's the difference. Good job, Meleon. Very detailed and great. Okay, and let's look at the last question here. Whose souls occupy the highest levels of Ilium? Anyone? Whose soul is in the highest levels of paradise? Will that be awesome. the prophet and the companions? Almost. Prophet Muhammad and the companions would be in the highest Anyone else? Whose souls occupy the highest levels? Anyone else? And the martyrs. Okay, you gave three different answers. No, we already talked about where the martyr souls are. Whose souls are in the highest levels, guys? Those are the souls that um has earned the love of Allah? No, 
All of us learned during the, all, anyone that's soul is in paradise earned the love of Allah. Whose soul is in the highest level? The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. By himself? Who at who no. nobody's forerunners? Uh, the, the souls, souls of, of the, the prophets. prophets. Hey, thank you. The souls of the prophets of Allah. Yes. All the, where you think G uh, not Jesus, where you think Moses, Abraham, Jonah, Job, Solomon, Abraham. I'm trying to name Noah. Where are they? Where are they at? Their souls are in the highest level. Why are they higher than even a martyr? Can anyone tell me why? Why are they higher than the companions in paradise right now? Why? Why? It's common sense. Why are their souls right now? Because this is not paradise. This is Ilim. This is El Berzak, a part of we ain't talking about what's going to happen on a day of judgment. I'm talking about before then. Why are the prophets' souls even higher than the companions, Lucy? Because Allah had chosen them to deliver a message to his people. Or just somebody, just common sense. Why are their souls higher than even a companion? Companions were chosen too, some of them, to deliver messages. We already talked about how I'm a messenger. Because if somebody give me the common sense answer, why are the prophets in a higher level of El Berzak than anyone else? All the prophets are. Why, uh, Tony? Uh, because they were not able to do I can't understand a word you said. Because, because what? they were not able to say. Boy, you echo. I don't know. We can't. I couldn't make out nothing you said. It's garbled. It's like you on a it sound like Charlie Brown. Anyone else? This is so easy. The teeth go Is it because they earned the love of Allah? We all earn the love of Allah oh, in paradise. Okay. Because they prophets. Thank you. Why y'all make the legend hard? Because they're prophets. <laughs> Do you think that even a boss is going to be of a higher level right now than Moses? My man? Moses was a prophet of Allah. And the prophets were the best of all human beings. They were the best of mankind. So right now, the prophets are in the highest levels of El Berza because they were prophets. Now on the day of judgment, the first people that will be judged is the nation of the prophet Muhammad. We Muslims. We will be judged first, and we will be the first to enter paradise, okay? But right now, the prophets are all together. Their souls are all together in the highest level. That's how the prophet Muhammad was able to meet them all on his journey, when he went on his night journey. And some of them are able to be on different levels of the heavens, too, of the skies, Allah allowed them to be on different levels of the skies, but they are higher than any other human being right now. They're in El Berzak. Okay. Does everybody understand that? So don't make it too hard. Why are they, is Moses and Jesus that way? Because they're prophets. Hello? 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 Wait a minute, this is DoorDash. Let me see if they at my door. Hold on, guys. Wherever he is, he didn't hang. Yes. Okay, guys. So, yeah, don't make it too hard on yourself. So the prophets of Allah, they are in the highest levels of El Berzak right now in the form of green bird. And they're in the form of green birds, too. Okay. Uh, the martyrs are in the crops. Uh, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said the souls of the martyrs are in the crops and they're flying around freely. 
The souls of the believers are hanging from the fruit of the trees. And the, the souls of the prophets of Allah are at the highest levels. Okay. All right. So that's the quiz from the last time we met and those about the three different types of souls. And again, all of us should be working on trying to uh, have the type of soul that is not deliberately, intentionally, knowingly sinning. We all make mistakes. Like say, for example, I can tell y'all right now, I don't know of no sin that I'm committing. Deli I, mean, I mean, I'm not perfect. I can tell you that I make mistakes a lot. Sometimes I use the B word. That's a mistake. Cause I can tell you, I, sometimes when I get angry, some of y'all, the little young kids are coming to this website and make me use that B word. I have, but I always repent. Sometimes my little granddaughter, you know, will push me to the over. I'll use that B word. That's a mistake. I repent. But am I doing anything that I know of that I should, I, I'm not drinking. I ain't having sex out of wedlock because I ain't got no wedlock. I ain't doing no drugs. Uh, I ain't lying, I ain't cheating, I ain't robbing, I ain't killing, you know, I ain't spreading nobody's rumors, you know, I don't know of me doing none of that stuff, okay, but do I make mistakes? Oh, yeah, I'll use that B word in a heartbeat, y'all know I do, and I feel so defeated when I do, that's the difference. The believer is not going to deliberately, intentionally, and knowingly do something that he know a law doesn't want him to do. But do we make mistakes? Do we slip up from time to time? Yes. Did the prophet Muhammad slip up and lose his temper sometimes? Yes, he did. He was not perfect. He was a human being. Okay, he made mistakes. He said, everyone makes mistakes, even me. But the difference is the believer is not going to deliberately, intentionally disobey Allah. The Prophet Muhammad made the mistake of turning his back, not thinking that Ibn, Mas, uh, that, that, um, uh, Ibn Um Maktoum was, was, was sincere about the religion. He thought he was somebody trying to play him. Okay. Sometimes the Prophet made mistakes and let his wives go a little bit too far. You know, we all, none of us are perfect. Okay, but did the prophets fornicate, uh, do any of that stuff knowingly, deliberately? No. The same with Abu Bakr, the same with Umar, same with Uthman, so same with, did these people deliberately, intentionally just go around disobeying the law? No, no, no. Okay, and that's what we can do. We can do this too, guys, but we have to stay in our homes. When Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she wrote, wrote a, a, a beautiful, lengthy tristice on the era of her doing that battle of the camel. It's when she left her home that she ended up doing things that she should not have done. And then one of the things she said is she sees why Allah said the home is better for a woman. Because when she made that great mistake of stepping outside of her home and into the shoes of, a, of something that she shouldn't have stepped into, lives were lost. And I'm not talking two or three or four. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lives were not destroyed, but were taken because she stepped out of her home, stepped out of the place of a woman, stepped out of the shoes that the prophet told her to stay in. And we women are good at that. That's why you women, y'all better get y'all butts in that house. It's a man's world. James Brown wasn't just singing. This is a man's world for real, guys. The men are supposed to be out there handling the masjid. They're supposed to be out there making the money, frying it up in a pan. That's all they job. We 
are supposed to be in this house. Working on changing our heart like you sisters are doing here. Yeah, alhamdulillah, you sisters are in here trying to learn the deen. You're changing your heart. You're changing the condition of yourself to that which is pleasing to Allah. This is what we're supposed to do. And this is a full-time job for us. Let that outside world, it's a man's world. Let the men take care of that world. Y'all understand that? And Aisha wrote a beautiful memoir on it. The biggest mistake she says she ever made and the one regret she has had to live to the day she died down was when she stepped out of that house into that battle that she should never have done. Don't make them the type of choices. All right. So now let's go to today's lecture because today what I'm going to do is continue on uh, with this soul. Hold on. Uh, and it's not going to be that much information. It's going to be a lot of information, but it's not going to be uh, too much to where you're going to, uh, where I'm going to take too much of your time. I think it's just seven slides because I tried to keep it short because I know it's the weekend and some of y'all want to do whatever they do on the weekend. I don't know. Okay. Today, we're going to answer the question that many of you have been asking me, does the body feel what happens to the soul? If the soul's being punished or whatnot for its sins, does the body feel it? What happens to the, the body or do they both feel it? We're going to go answer this question. First of all, do, are, there's different answers to this question, depending on if you have the correct belief system or not. The scholars of column, in other words, these are the scholars that we have many of today, the PhD men. Uh, these are the cauteria, uh, the degrees in psychology. I know I'm gonna make you angry again, but who cares? The, de the degrees in psychology, degrees in philosophy and all the other ologies that don't mean anything. Uh, uh, these are the groups of people uh, uh, that they existed during the time of the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They existed during the time of the companions. They existed during the time of the four Imams, Ibn Taymiyyah, and they exist today. And just like the prophet and the companions and the four Imams and Ibn Taymiyyah and them fought against them, I'm fighting against them too, whether you like it or not. Who cares about your feet? Pick them up and walk straight. Then maybe you wouldn't have to be offended. But these people uh, are the ones that deny the blessing and they deny the punishment of El Berzak completely, okay? And the reason they do is deny this is, uh, is that they believe that the soul is independent of the body. In their view, the soul is life and that the soul does not remain after death. So they believe there is no blessing and no punishment until Allah resurrects us. This was the view expressed by many of the Mutazila, also the Asharis, and such as a man that uh, you guys not haven't heard of him, but people listening to me do, El Qadi Abu Bakr. And this view was opposed by many people. And by the way, to believe that the soul is life and that it does not remain after death, this contradicts la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Dor, Rasulullah, and the companions executed people who believe this. When you read the history of Islam, if uh, one of these Mutazila came and told the companions this crap, Umar would have them executed. Ibn Abbas executed them. Everybody did. The four imams, everybody. We don't go around executing people today, but we know to stay away from these people who believe this stuff. Okay? So if you're dealing with those type of so-called Muslims, you know, and you can recognize who they are. Anybody that's telling you that when you die, there is no uh, uh, pain and there is no blessing 
until Allah raises us up. They say we just die and stay in the grave. Then you need to run away from those so-called Muslims because they are not really Muslims. That's why I'm calling them Muslim because they're denying what Allah says, okay? Then there are other, because like I told you guys, these sets and groups, as the prophet said, we will divide into over 73 sets. And each set has their own divisions. These Kataria people, there's about 20 different sets of them. And so you have other scholars amongst them. They say that what is blessed or punished in the grave is just the body. How many of you heard that? How many of you have an imam that tells you that when we die, the body is the only thing that's punished? Okay. And this view is also expressed by a group amongst the, the scholars of Hadith, including Ibn al zauni Y'all don't know who he is, but other people listening to me know who he is. Yeah, Layla knows her stuff. Okay? That's why we have to be careful when you read them Hadiths and you don't know if they authentic or not. You busy worried about whether or not a hadith has only one narrator or not. You better be careful who you read a hadith uh, from. Hello. So these people, and if you, and I know many, I know many people in real life who believe this, who belong to this Cotterian thought too, okay? That when a person dies, the body is the only part that is punished. The soul is not. Well, this is wrong, okay? What about the PhDers that are famous today? Well, the philosophers, they believe that the blessings and the punishment happen only to the soul. They believe the opposite. Many of these famous speakers that y'all listen to, when I'm playing these lectures in my Zoom room at night, we hear them. I've heard a bunch of them say this, that the soul is punished, which it is, but that the body is not. And by the way, there are many people, you know, who call themselves people of the Sunnah, such as the men who, are, who I play at night in my Zoom room, they have this view. And they weren't the only ones that had this view. Ibn Maysera had this view too. Also, Ibn Hazm. Why do y'all think I don't use that much of Ibn Hazm? But Ism Hazm had Ibn Hazm had this view too. That's why when I'm telling y'all the stories of the Quran, when I'm telling y'all the stories from the Quran or the stories of the prophets, I don't use certain people's opinions. I don't use Ibn Hazm much. I'm going to tell you what Ibn Abbas said. I'm going to tell you what Umar said. I'm going to tell you what the original companion said. I don't care about those other views. If Ibn Abbas tells us that this happened, I could care less what Ibn Hazm or anyone else had to say because they don't understand this deen like Ibn Abbas did or Ibn Umar or Aisha. Or Ibn Masu. Y'all get that? So to this day, many people that you guys know of, and I'm not going to, I don't have to name their names. I play them in my Zoom room at night, so y'all know who they are anyway. But many of these brothers who are famous that y'all listen to belong to this third group. They, you will hear them in their lectures say that when you die, the soul is doing, is experiencing this, the soul is experiencing that, and they say the body is not. And you will hear them quote uh, uh, Ibn Hazm a lot. Ibn Hazm a lot. And then the second view, you will hear many people say this too, that uh, um, um, the body is punished. Well, both of these answers are incorrect. I'm going to tell you the correct view. And this is the view that Ibn Abbas and the original companions had. The first generation of companions had this view. This is also uh, the view that Ibn Taymiyyah carried too. And as Ibn Taymiyyah said, the soul is distinct from the body. 
Even though the soul is separate from the body, it's still connected to it. This is the view of the original companions. It's not the view of Ibn Hazm and others. It's not the view of some of the third generation of Muslims. It may not be the view of some of the second generation of Muslims, but it's the view of the originals. As Ibn Taymiyyah said, the punishment and the blessing happened to both the soul and the body. And that's the consensus of the true people of the Sunnah. The soul is blessed or punished separately. But even though it's, it's punished separately, the body feels it. Do y'all understand? So even though the soul may be in the hellfire being punished for the sins that person died upon, the body is in the grave, but it still feels it. That's the view of Ibn Abbas. Aisha, and all the original companions. So I don't want to hear about the third generation people's view. The third generation don't out trump the first. And that brings us to another question. Does a person know anything about what is happening in this world when he dies? We have authentic hadith, which you guys know that does say that the dead can hear the sound of their friend's footsteps when they leave the grave. That hadith is authentic. Our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, <clears throat> when a person is put in the grave and his companions leave him, he hears the sound of their footsteps. And then we have the other authentic hadith, how after the battle of Badr, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood over the bodies of, the, uh, the, uh, of Abu Jahal and them, and he asked them, you know, uh, have you found what your Lord promised to be true? And Umar heard him talking and said, oh, Prophet of Allah, they can't hear us. They can't respond. So why are you talking to them? And he said, Allah allowed them to hear me but they cannot reply. So based on these two hadiths, a lot of people say, well, Allah says in the Quran, if the dead cannot hear you and the dead cannot see you, but we have these two hadiths. Well, listen to how Ibn Taymiyyah answered this. He said, yes, indeed. These texts and other verses show that the dead can hear the speech of the living in general, but it does not mean they can hear them all the time. So yes, the dead is allowed to hear the last footstep as it leaves his grave. Yes, Allah allowed the dead to hear the prophet Muhammad. Okay, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But that doesn't mean at all times. Again, Allah says you cannot make the dead hear you. Listen to how Ibn, Ibn Tayyami explained this. He said what this verse means is the hearing of acceptance. The hearing that causes us to obey Allah and listen to Allah. Allah in this verse of the Quran is comparing the kafirs to a dead person who you can talk to till you turn red in the face. But that person doesn't answer you. That person cannot talk. That person cannot understand you. He's saying, so this is what this means. You know, he said, you can talk to the dead all you want, but the dead can only hear what Allah allows them to hear. Allah allows us to hear the footsteps that leave our grave. Allah allowed the prophet Muhammad uh, uh, to be heard by those uh, fallen dead. But Allah made it so that they have no way of communicating back and Allah even uh, make it where they can't even understand you. So that's how we answer that question. Can the dead hear you? No, not in the sense that we know of. The dead can only hear what Allah will have them hear. They can hear 
the cries of the other people in the graves being punished. When you're dead and you're in your grave, you will hear the people next to you screaming and hollering. The Hadith say that. Allah allows them to hear that. Just like Allah allows them to hear the footsteps. But can I go to your grave and just talk to you and you hear me? No, not unless Allah allows it. Y'all understand that? So this is why we don't go to the graves and talk to people because they're not a part of this world. What are you doing? You're wasting your time. They can't benefit you. They cannot answer you. They cannot even understand you unless Allah allowed them to. So this is why we don't get off into this, this shirk. Does everybody understand? So the dead can only hear what Allah allows them to hear. We already talked about how uh, when you die, the two angels, Munker and Nakir, they will come and talk to you and you will answer them back. Okay. So these hadiths are all proof that the dead can hear and talk, but only what Allah will allow them to hear and talk. Allah allows them to hear those angels and answer them back. Allah allows them to hear your footsteps, but does Allah allow them to listen to you because you sitting at their grave talking to them? It's a different, whole, total different thing. So that's the answer. So if your children ask you, can the dead hear us, Umi? You say the dead can only hear what Allah allows them to hear. This is why we don't waste our time talking to them. Because they're not a part of this world. They can't help you. They can't harm you. So that's why there's no need in talking to them. If the dead person was a Muslim, Make dua for him or her, asking Allah to forgive them of their sins because they're either being punished or they're that green bird. We don't know which one they are. So this is why the prophet ta taught us to make dua for them. But as far as talking to them about your everyday life, take your talks, your complaints, your problems to Allah. Allah says, bring your problems to him, not to no dead person, because the dead cannot benefit you. Everybody understand that? So that's the most correct answer. That's the view of the first generation of Muslims. I don't want to hear about what Ibn Hazm and the second or third generations had to say, because they don't understand this religion better than those first. That's why I've been teaching y'all all these years to understand Abu Bakr is the best, Umar the second. That's why I taught you there's a hierarchy that we follow as Muslims. Because you will see, like the prophet said, each generation of Muslims becomes further and further away from the truth. The companions were with the prophet. The original companions knew him. The second, many of the second generation didn't even get to get to meet the prophet. They never met him. They never talked to him. And the third didn't know him at all. So the further and further and further away from the truth we, be, we become. So that's why Allah says the best is the first generation. And we got enough of them. Ibn Abbas was a scholar of the Quran. Ibn Masood, a scholar of the Quran. Aisha, a scholar of the Quran. Ibn Umar, a scholar of the Quran. They went through all these verses and gave us the meaning. So there's really no need to look to see what the other ones had to say. Ibn Abbas and all of them already answered, can a person hear, hear you? They already said it. Yeah, they can hear whatever Allah will cause them to hear. But can they hear you? complaining to them and crying to them, that's something different. Allah is probably not going to allow that because that's shirk. That's worshiping someone other than Allah. And Allah says in the Quran, bring your problems to him. Call upon him for help, for assistance, not anything else. All right. So I'm going to stop right here for today. Uh, inshallah. 
uh, uh, Monday, we'll continue with what happens now, you know. So, Supanakala Huma Wabi Hamdika, a Shadowan Laila Haila Enta, a Stock Faruka Watubo Lake. Any questions or comments? <laughs> 